Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Literacy View. This is Dyslexia Awareness Month. We are kicking off October with parents. These are courageous, badass moms and their teens. And so we're going to be talking about how each one of these moms got help for their children, not easily, I might add. There's a long road ahead. They're going to share their stories, but we will talk about the successes as well. So the moms we have today are Sherry Vale, and we have Denora Della Camera, and we have Stacy Klein. And when those moms are talking, they could then introduce their children if they choose to, you know, want to contribute to the conversation, right? So I'm going to start off with Denora because I've known Denora the longest. And um, Denora and I go back now six years and I've tutored both her sons. Her son, Chris, joins us today, but I've oh. also worked with her son, Matthew. And, um, you know, Denora is one of those moms who's relentless. You just don't want to mess with Denora. She is a fighter and she um, really challenges anyone who um, wants to stop what she needs to do for her kids. She's very tough, smart. And I want to start with Denora's story first. So Denora, tell us a little bit about how this all started and where we are now, because I can't even believe um, how big Chris is now and how awesome he's doing. So. I, you know, why don't you kick it off for us? Okay. Um, well, I guess this, this goes back a ways back. Um, so six years ago, we met. You did a talk at the school, I believe. Um, SEPTA had you do a talk about reading. I wasn't able to make the talk, but I heard, heard all about it. And I couldn't wait to reach out to you um, because I, was, I had um, my youngest son, Matthew, was really struggling to read. Um, and a lot of my energy was going towards trying to figure out what was going on with him. Um, the school had already um, determined that he had an IEP, but that um, he probably needed to go into self-contained and he would never learn to read or write at grade level, that I had lofty goals if I thought he ever would because of his dyslexia. They said that they never really um, had dealt with dyslexia before, which I thought was really odd because it's one in five. And, you know, that's kind of like me as a veterinarian saying, I've never heard a heart murmur. That would be a problem because they're common if I've never heard one in 20 years. And, you know, <laughs> there's probably something not right with me not realizing what um, what they look like in the classroom or how they can present. Um, I'm so it turned stop out. For a second. So I just want to be very clear. So you were told that your son would never read, and that was in kindergarten. Um, first, well, kindergarten into first grade that I had lofty goals if I thought he'd ever read at grade level. It was really first grade. Um, and they were pulling him out to do LLI and to do a lot of the balance literacy before I knew any better. What really um, shed light into everything and was the most enlightening was your book, um, I, was Failing Students or Failing Schools, I think it's called. And that really opened my eyes to what was going on. Um, and I just realized that it was just the way he was being taught because he did not have a cognitive deficit. His um, IQ testing was fine, and it was really just the teaching piece of it. But I felt like all the teachers really cared, and they all really wanted to do what was best for him, but they just didn't know what to do. It's not that they didn't want to try. It's not that they didn't want to give him help, but they were just it, it, so frustrated because nothing was working. But it's because everything they did was balanced literacy-based because that's what the school um, believes in and kept doing. Um not because they wanted to hurt anybody, but just that's just all they, they knew and the, all that they had. Well, within like six months of working with Faith, he was reading uh, so much better. He was advancing. He was making so much progress and they were just completely amazed. And that kind of um, 
because Matthew took so much of my focus, I was kind of ignoring Chris. I wasn't realizing that he was struggling too. And he almost had like more of like a stealth dyslexia where he was reading. But when you looked at his handwriting, he couldn't spell the words that he could read. And he couldn't even, even his spellings were that of a dyslexic. Like you'd look at his writing and he, he would have broken sentences. He would have um, words that did not belong together. His writing was was just... Not, I mean, you remember Faith. Um, yes, so, no. I wanna, so I want to just stop for a second. So to, to make this clear for everybody, I started with Denora's younger son. And only through working with her younger son did she realize that her older son also had difficulties. Right. But Chris did not present the same way as right. Matthew. He was able to hide it a little bit better. Right. You know, and that's what I want to make clear to parents that sometimes some of these difficulties are not glaring, right. but they're still present and they still weigh on kids tremendously. So go ahead, Denora. I'm sorry. And I think the main thing here and what's a very good point to make is that it exists in a spectrum. You know, some may have a high, a, more of a weakness in the writing piece of it. Some may have a, a beginning piece of the reading part that's hard and some may have just all areas. Like, I think there's just different variations. I don't think there's just one clear cut way it always presents. Um, and I think the, my kids are examples of that where his handwriting and his written work was worse than almost Matthew's in the beginning. And, but yet he could read, but he couldn't read as well. He could read better than what he could ever write on paper. I think when they tested him at school, it was, I know you're not supposed to use the discrepancy model, but he was at like the 95th percentile or something for reading for his grade. But then his writing was only at like the 49th percentile. So it was like a frustration profile where he could never get on paper what his thoughts. Okay. Um, she'll get back on. <laughs> I don't know what just happened. Let me just see. Hold on. Is that me? Yes. Yep. Uh, I, yeah. Yeah. I don't know what just happened. I don't know. Okay. Strange. So you said there was a discrepancy. Yeah, between his what he could read and writing what he could and the reading, paper. and right. even his thoughts, like what he could ex verbally express, was so much higher level than what he could put on paper. And it was between the spelling and the gr and just putting together a grammatically correct sentence. I still remember going. He was in third grade, and they had um, published, you know, articles that they did, um, and he did one on um, coral a reef. coral reef, and he wrote a sentence, and this really struck me. He wrote even sharks with an exclamation mark. And I was just taken aback. So I'm like, that's not a complete sentence. Why is this hanging on the wall? Why didn't anyone correct it? And they just did not want to squash, you know, creativity. They were okay with not correcting what they're writing in the marble notebooks. Okay with just letting things go um, just because they wanted the kids just to write voluminously, but not necessarily um, get them writing, you know, the correct sentence yeah. structure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so the there was um, a lot of writing going on, but not necessarily using correct sentence structure, um, paragraphs, things that you would hope for at a certain point. So anyhow, um, so for you, this was very frustrating. And I remember not only going to these meetings at school, oh God. but you actually would help other parents in your school. And I know that they look to you for advice. You became kind of like the local advocate for all of these other moms who did not know what was going on. Yeah. I mean, I always try to help anyone on the same journey and the same path because it is so scary when, you know, as a mom, you want what's best for your child. And when you see your kids struggling, despite, you know, all efforts and all hands on deck, you don't know what to do. And if I can help anyone just from what I've learned, and I really credit so much to you, Faith, because if it wasn't for you, I don't know where my kids would be right now. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart, because I think that, you know, you assume if you're in a, a school district that's supposed to be very high performing, that they're going to be doing everything like state of the art and evidence based best practices. It's not necessarily that it's a lot of tutoring. A lot of private tutoring is what is creating the, that illusion of um, high performance. It's not necessarily what's going on in the classroom. It's what uh, privately you're able to afford to to pay for on the side because they're and not necessarily getting it there and that's what why I advocate I advocate 
and why I tell my kids to advocate too and to speak up about it is because it's not fair to those who can't. You know, it shouldn't be based on someone who's able to afford to hire someone to teach their child to read and write properly when they should be learning that in the classroom. A hundred percent. So your route was to go for private tutoring and that's how you and I met. And, yes. um, and you really were not getting, well, we, tried, we had the IEP in school. You had services. It just, we weren't getting anywhere. Right. And he was right. getting pulled for stuff, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't right. clicking. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So now that's your story. And Chris, I'm going to come back to you. Don't think I forgot about you. Um, because I definitely want to talk to you about, um, you know, what you've been doing. And I, I think it's very interesting. Anyhow, that's one parent's story that she decided to go for the private tutoring. And again, some people are fortunate enough to be able to do that. Others aren't. And others choose a different route, too, or maybe a combination of both. So now, Stacy Klein. Stacy, you are in Minnesota and you have many years of um, dealing with your school district, your local school district. Could you tell us a little bit about the history of what happened with you and what you had to do in order to help your son? Absolutely. And thank you for allowing us to share our stories and um, help more parents understand that they're not alone. And even though the road is difficult, um, there are many, many practitioners like yourself, Faith, um, and parents like us who are trying to pave a smoother way. Uh, so my son entered our public school system in 2014. It's now 2024, so 10 years ago. And for the first several years, three, four years, we trusted the school. So when we um, went to them and asked for our son to be evaluated, um, he did receive an IEP right away, and he began receiving reading interventions right away. But they never um, uh, qualified him under the SLD, or Specific Learning Disability Qualification. So there was data in the original evaluation that they did for him for special education that contained all the information they needed to qualify him as a student with dyslexia, uh, but they did not communicate that to us. So that right there was a big stumbling block for us uh, ensuring that Max got progress or got the services he needed to make meaningful progress, but we didn't know that because it was withheld from us. Um, not until he was in the second grade did we start questioning um, what we were being told. You know, this progress reports for the, from the IEP would come back with words like he's made great progress um, without data to substantiate that. And when I would ask more data driven questions, the relationship got more difficult. Um, I learned that in his IEP, he was being measured based on the Fountas and Pinnell ladder of reading. Um, we know how erroneous that is. It's not an evidence-based program, um, doesn't meet the standards of law for the um, Every Student Succeeds Act um, that requires evidence-based instruction. But again, parents um, shouldn't have to be attorney generals knowing education and knowing law in order to navigate the public school system for such a critical life skill such as reading. And I believe that very, very strongly. Um, so we uh, tried to collaborate with the school for longer than we should have, because for years, Max uh, really struggled. And so finally, at the end of his third grade year, we filed for due process. And we had to um, get the services of a special education attorney to navigate that process. Um, we prevailed. We, as parents, had the burden of proof in that impartial uh, due process hearing, and we prevailed. And a court order was issued for my son to receive 90 minutes every day, five days a week, including summers of structured literacy intervention, as well as 20 minutes of um, Hegarty, which is a phonemic awareness um, program. And I don't um, advocate or uh, market for specific programs. I'm happy to share what worked for my son, but I'm aware that there are 
a multitude of good evidence-based structured literacy interventions out there. Um, and different ones work with different practitioners and different student populations. Can I, Stacy? may I interrupt for a second? I know that you and I had spoken and you said that you did try private tutoring for a yes. number of years. Could you just say what happened? Because your experience was different from Denora's. And I want yes. that to be very clear that just because people get tutors, it doesn't mean that all tutoring is going to be the same. So, Yeah. And thank you, Faith, for prompting me about that. Because when Max was in kindergarten, um, his kindergarten teacher offered to tutor him in the summer. And so, you know, we still had uh, a relationship of trust uh, and collaboration with the district. And we thought, well, this is wonderful, right? Never questioned what she'd be using, never questioned if it was effective or what, what he needed. Um, and so we did that. And we did that the next summer. We also went through um, the community education with our district, um, Minnetonka Community Education Association, our collaboration. And um, he got more of the same of what he was getting in school that wasn't working. So when when you hear uh, teachers talk about double dose, um, you know, that to me would would warrant questioning double dose of what double dose of something that's structured literacy that's working or double dose of balanced literacy that's just going to waste your time and money and frustrate your student. Um, it wasn't until I sought uh, counsel from the private sector and started reaching out to experts, um, a local private school that specializes in teaching students with dyslexia and learning disabilities, did I learn that what we had been doing um, was getting us nowhere. We were on a, a frustrating merry-go-round. And so not until I sought um, education from the private sector did we change course in terms of what we got in terms of private tutoring? Um, then we did start getting tutoring in Wilson, primarily because that's what our local private school for dyslexic students was using. And our school district had that. They just denied providing it for my student. So then you you ended up suing the school district. And how long did that take? Seems the, like a very- Getting through process. due process took the period of, I think we filed in August of 2019. In January of 2020, and a ruling was issued and he began receiving his court ordered services. Um, However, the school district then engaged in two federal civil lawsuits uh, against my student, which was against our family because we defended his rights um, to appeal that ruling and remove his court ordered services for structured literacy. So the first appeal went to federal district court at the state level. That took another year. And we prevailed again at the federal district level. Uh, his court order remained intact. Um, there was some erosion in the ruling of uh, the look back of they tried to, to state that they gave him too much compensatory education, that they shouldn't be able to go back all the way to kindergarten to find a pattern of um, educational harm. Um, they appealed that ruling, they being the school district, and that went to the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals. And that took about another year, maybe a little longer. Um, and the circuit courts are just one court below the Supreme Court level. So to give you a sense of the length and depth um, of punishment that school districts and the educational professional organizations that they belong to are willing to go to protect um, to protect themselves um, as adult licensed practitioners was uh, really eye-opening. So it was really putting adult interests ahead of the children. And, and I mean, essentially. It was. It, it's it's an, an evasion of accountability um, and protecting uh, the professional conduct of the adults in the system. All right. And then, so that's Stacy Klein who took this all the way up and spent thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to do this. 
And then we have Sherry Bell. And I know Sherry also has a story. And her route to helping her daughter was a little bit different in the end. So why don't you tell us, Sherry, about what you did? Okay. Well, thank you for having us on. And um, it actually, so we have to back up and tell us, tell you our family history. So um, I have dyslexia. My husband has dyslexia. We have a dyslexia family. My parents, and at that age, you didn't, you just couldn't read. So um, fast forward, having babies. And so I have seven children. Three of them are biological. Four of them are adopted. So um, on the other note, also, there are also disabilities in that area, too. So that all comes together as well with IEPs. Um, so we started with our oldest son. So I thought everything was great. He was so brilliant. And he starts pre-K and we have his name up on the wall and say it every night. And he still cannot repeat his name back, how to spell his name back to me. And we, you know, finally we make it up to second grade and everybody's telling me that I'm not reading with my son. That it's my fault because we're not reading enough with him. So, I mean, I'm sure everybody has gotten that, right? So um, at the time, so my son right now is... 19. So that was quite a few years ago. So there wasn't very much out there, but I knew that I had to do something. So the only thing I can think of was to start to collect his work. Very important. Collect all work. And so I started to collect his work and um, got him a tutor and a private tutor. And she kept saying to me, they're not giving you what he's supposed to have. And I'm saying, well, the school is telling me he's getting reading. No, it was not reading. It was reading groups that he was in. So finally, get to fourth grade. He's failing horribly. Um, I didn't know what to do. And I still have all this paperwork that I've been collecting, all of his failing grades, everything that the teachers are telling me and all this stuff. And um, and I... Um, back up. I go and I go to a specialist and I get him tested for dyslexia. And I'm like, yes, this is it. It's proof, right? You've got to be over eight. This is it. This is it. She shows up in the room and she turns to them and goes, I know you're a small school district, so you can't afford to give him any services. What is going on? <laughs> what is going on? So here I am back to square one again. So I finally, um, I don't know what to do. And there's not much out there because at the time there was not, there was more forums than there were Facebook. Okay. So, so I, I, I'm looking, I'm looking and I find an advocate and I go, well, I know that a male presence in the room is much stronger than a female. So, and many times my husband was there, but got frustrated. So I chose a male advocate. Very, 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 I'm, I'm a strong mom, but not not as um, ethical as I would have run the show, um, but he got what I needed. So we did um, tell them that we were filing for um, a due process. So they flipped out, put us in a room with the lawyer and say, Mrs. Vale, what do you want? And I said, exactly what you're supposed to be giving my child, reading and writing and arithmetic. Give me the bit. He can't do any of this stuff. He can't even find the exit if, if something went wrong because he can't even read it. So this is what we need. So, the, okay, okay, what else? I know that I've heard Orton Gillingham is the way. I think it's a program. It's not a program. You know, so so here we are. So they, I, I'm saying, okay, this is what I want. They say, okay, great. They give me somebody. Everything is good. They give money to me and it goes to the advocate. So that's where that went. Um, fast forward, my son, then they say, well, you know what? He really needs a little bit more. We're going to put him in a couple of times in with the teacher who can help with, with his reading into self-contained. Now, I start reading and reading and reading to find out that the children will have to be kind of on the same level. And they wouldn't let me in the room to see if he was on the, the same level. So they tell me, only a couple of days in self, 
uh, only a couple of hours and self-contained. Come to find out, they put him in all day. Fought to get him out. He's out now. He, he does his own thing. He does whatever he can to get by. At this point, <laughs> she's laughing. At this point, you know, he's a boy. He's starting, you know, to become a teen and he doesn't want any part of it. So, you know, he has his, he has OT, he has reading, he's doing whatever he has to do. He, he has, you know, charisma. He's able to, you know, everybody loves him. There goes that, right? He can make, he's, makes his way up. Then comes Kira. So now I am the dreaded parent that nobody wants the kids because I'm going to say to you, well, if this is what's on the IEP, I expect this on the IEP, you know, you to do this. So, and, and, and I always told my children, cause they go, mom, you know, you're embarrassing me. And I said, listen, it's not only about you. It's about everybody else who comes after you and your friends who also can't read. And that's what we did notice is that, you know, like the other parents, you know, people are asking you and, 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 and it's all good. Every, everybody's going to benefit from this. So my son continues. And then I have Kira come through. So my second child, he, he's all good. He can read, he can write, he's, you know. So then I have Kira and I noticed this thing's going on. Oh, wait a minute. I forgot one big thing. There was a teacher who went to bat for me saying, I'm not leaving this IEP. And I had no idea what she was talking about. This, this meeting, I'm sorry, a meeting until you put LD on that paper. I had no idea what that meant. And they did it. She got booted out, out of her classroom, to the other school. They, and she said to me when she got out, I will not let them do to your son what they did to mine. So, so, so Sherry, so when, just for everybody, so LD learning disability, Mm -hmm. And that meant that she was going to go out of the room the whole day. Oh, no, no. This teacher got, she got, she got booted out of her classroom and they changed. So she had a um, third grade class for years. They put her into the middle school. As a punishment. Yep. How dare you speak? Yep. 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 Yes, 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 yes. And, and, you know, and that, that was a big deal, you know, for me as, you know, as a parent and, and I mean, she put everything on the line for us. She really did. Um, very, very grateful for that because that's what started me to really understand, like, wait a minute, what does LD mean? There's something wrong with my kid. I, I mean, I knew that I couldn't read and dyslexia. Yeah. Okay. Keep on going. But so then Kira comes along. She can't read. I get the teacher. One of my favorite teachers says to me, Oh, she just doesn't read enough at home. And they don't try hard enough. Yeah. Oh, and she doesn't try hard enough. So no, 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 no. And again, I saved all of her paperwork. And then they had all the tech. So then I said, okay, well, you're going to test her. And they tested her. And of course, her grades were, she had 90s on some of the testing, and then she got 30s. And I had all of her paper. And I said, listen, the only thing I do know is, when they have really high grades and really low grades, something's going on. <laughs> this is LD for what I understand, learning disability. So, so what you do? What, what did you decide to do? Because I know you said you sued, you did, you, you went. So, right? so, so then, what did you decide to do? So I, I let the school do what they were supposed to do, right? So I think my daughter, she's getting reading. I'm like, what are you doing? She's not getting reading. So this goes all the way up. And so I got, I got a whole bunch of, um, this is what I want everybody to understand. Accommodations is not remediation. So accommodations are help. They're helping your child pass. They're, they're giving them things to help them read. They're giving them things to help them write. But they're not teaching them how to read and write and spell. That is the biggest thing. I had no idea. Judy, I, is that a cheers? We we have to interrupt because that is definitely a big one. So accommodation is not remediation. It's helping you get through school, but it doesn't necessarily teach the kids the how, the how to read, how to write. Big cheers. Thank you. 
Do you know, you know which the saying about a fish? Give a man a fish, he eats for a day, teach him how to fish. That is it. That that's truly and honestly it. So I had no idea that I thought I did the right thing. My kids have all these wonderful accommodations and she's getting 90s and hundreds and she's on a roll and everything is great. And then comes what grade? The end of ninth grade. And she says, mom, I can't read. You know, it comes to a point where you stop listening to your child read. You just assume they're reading and she's getting 90s. Everything is great. But what do you mean you can't read? Mom, I can't read. Now, yeah, we've got the books, you know, like, you know, here's Hank and she could read that, but not really. So I said, okay, back to the drawing board. Now what do I do? So now we have Facebooks. Look, 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 look. And I found a wonderful, I found a whole bunch of resources. And I, and I, as a mom, I found a wonderful book that only taught reading. And I said, I know for some reason that's just not enough. That everybody was saying that this was the book. And then I found another book that taught, it taught how to parent, how, taught, helped the parent teach reading and spelling together. And I purchased that book. So she purchased The Word Wasp. And this is a book that I've mentioned numerous times. Um, we have a Facebook group called Word Wasp USA Support because they now have an American edition. And Sherry, I think you heard me recommend it. I don't even know how that came about, but somehow you got the word wasp and then found me and we were talking about it. So you used word wasp and you ended up teaching your own child to read after years of being in school and no one else being able to do the job it and was, hiring it, tutors and all this other stuff. Oh yes. We had tutors too. Yeah. Um, it was amazing. So, so we started with the, the, the more basic book because I didn't know what I was doing and you don't need to know what you're doing because the book tells you what to do. So I started with the Hornet. Okay. So I started with the Hornet and the teachers, I fought for reading. So she had a reading teacher and um, and I fought for reading, and I knew that I was um, I was going to say something. We kept it a big secret that we were that I started teaching her in the summer, um, because I really wanted to see if it was going to work. Yeah, got to test it, right? I don't want to, you know. So so I um, waited, and then Kira went into school. And the teacher, they get this reading thing and blah, blah, blah. And Kira's, she's basically opening up scholastic news. And we need to step back and also say, I do not blame the teachers. They're only doing the best that they can with the knowledge that they have. Really, I, you know, she was only doing her best. And um, so, you know, Kira was doing scholastic news. And... Um, I, I said, I, I called a, a meeting with all the reading teachers and I said, so I, you know, called a meeting after teaching Kira with Hornet and going into Word Wasp. And I said, um, I want a meeting and, and, and everybody is of course afraid of Mrs. Vale and they are all lined up and ready to go. And I walk in with, because now I've been educating myself with my law books, because I know that they're allowed to have outside resources. Because they're allowed to print off, we don't call them dittos, whatever you call them anymore, and bring them in and hand them to the kids, right? So I knew that they were allowed to have outside resources. So I had all my law books, and I walked in, and I put it down, and I looked at the, the reading teacher, and I said, so how's she doing? She said, oh, my goodness, she's doing great. And I said, yeah, she is, and I really want to thank you. You know, you're, you know, she's really working hard with you. And you know what? I've been doing this, and I put it on the table, and I said... Um, this is what I've been teaching her with. Um, and I said, and I'm requesting this to be an outside resource. Let's go back to where Kira was reading on a beginning second grade le reading level when she entered 10th grade. Second grade, beginning second grade reading level. There's letters, it was an H, right? 
the letters that they're using at the school, right? And um, and so I gave this book, and then we continued what we were doing and handed the book to the school and allowed them to pretty much go off of that book. I didn't want to mess them up, you know, just kept dabbling a little bit here and there with Kira. And by the time they went to test Kira, she, you want to, want to chime in? No. She, um, they couldn't test her anymore. So the letters that they go up to is a Z plus. So by the time Kira was finishing school, which was less than 10 minutes, 10 months later, Kira had already passed all of the testing that they could do. And it really comes down to how, what are you teaching them? How are you teaching them? And to find the right thing. So a dyslexic mom taught her dyslexic daughter how to read. Yep. Using a book that costs about 40 bucks, something like that, give or take. Oh, yep. You know, 20 something for the Hornet, 40 something maybe for Word Wasp. And you did that yourself. So we have three different moms. Judy Boxner. Oh, wait. I just wanted to say one other yep. thing. Um, I, I asked them to purchase the book. They purchased the book. It came home with Kira at the end. And they used the book for how many other students? Mm -hmm. Two or three. Two or three other students. So, but, so thank you. Yes. Yeah. Great. So Judy, we have three moms here. Try tutoring, some successful, some not so successful, some suing, some successful with suing, others not so much, others taking on the job themselves and just doing it. So Judy, what are some of your thoughts listening to these moms? Any questions, any, any thoughts you have? I have so many buzzing in my head. Well, the first thing I want to say is thank you to the kids for joining us. And Stacy, thank you for your son. I know he's somewhere in that apartment, too. I think that's so amazing. I'm a mom of two boys, and uh, I think it's really great that you guys joined. A lot of the time, the kids are like, don't talk about me or don't tell my story. And I think that's like so amazing that you guys are so brave to tell your story and to tell the whole world that, you know, you had some learning issues and you overcame them so that other kids know that they're not alone because I work with so many kids that are struggling to read. And, you know, a lot of those kids, unfortunately, they may have good parents, but their parents aren't fighting right now as hard as yours because maybe those parents are poor or they don't even know what to do. And I think that who knows, maybe those kids will turn on YouTube or turn on the literacy view or see this. And I hope that it goes viral so that other parents fight as hard as your badass moms are fighting for you. And I just can't thank, you know, all of you kids, the three of you, uh, for being here today and being brave enough, A, to listen to all these stories. I know it took a lot of patience to probably listening to your moms tell the stories, but um, just seeing your beautiful faces and seeing you smile and and uh, being here is spectacular. But, you know, the story doesn't surprise me because I, I have to say it, and I still work in the school system. I think the school system is failing so many kids, and it's not okay. It's not okay. And I know that the school systems now are shifting towards the science of reading, but they're not all shifting as fast. And some schools are shifting a little bit and some schools are doing combination approaches of some structured literacy with some balanced literacy. And it really concerns me how many kids are still, oh my God, we have another kid on. This is the best day of my life. Oh my God. Oh my God. I am so proud. That's just, this is the best moment of my life. Like you have no idea, kids. I am so it's such a kid person, and um, this means everything to me that you guys are here to tell your story to the whole world and um, hopefully help a lot of kids because there's a lot of kids that need help right now. I'm seeing a lot of older kids that can't read, and um, I actually saw a lot of kids today that can't read, and 
I was in a fourth grade classroom and there's kids that are struggling with their letters and sounds. And it makes me wonder, how are schools letting this happen that kids are getting into the higher grades and they can't read? How are more moms not screaming from the rooftops that their kids can't read? So um, my question is, is what advice would you kids give to the world about how we're going to fix this for more kids? I want to hear from the kids. For the, the, the what are they, young adults, teenagers? Anybody? So, yeah, so let's, I think Chris is gnawing at the bit to write. Tell, tell hey. us, I'm going to start with Christopher, okay? Christopher was actually interviewed by AP News, and he just impressed me so much because I read the newspaper article, and I was so like, nice. it was amazing. So, you know what? I want to start with Chris first. Chris, tell us a little bit about um, what Judy is asking. What advice would you give? Um, I think it just kind of boils down to the, the foundation at the elementary level. I think we need to, I guess, provide children with like adequate foundation in order for them to succeed at a, like higher levels and whether it be middle school or high school, they need that like foundation. And Chris, from what I read, you were kind of bored in middle school with what you were given to read. So once you actually learned to read, you wanted to read. And what was happening in middle school that turned you off? Well, they pretty much kind of babied it down. I mean, in seventh grade, we didn't even get um, the the copies of the books. We were given um, a printed out like PDF from the internet. And for um, when we read A Christmas Carol, we weren't even... Um, we didn't even read a Christmas carol. We read um, the the play, the play script for it. So it was a short summary. Is that what you're saying, or like an abridged version? It was an abridged version of the classic. Yeah, pretty much. And then um, we didn't even really read it. It was kind of put on um, an audio book on the smart board. Like a lot of classrooms have smart smart boards nowadays, um, but it was pretty much played out loud to us. So. I'm pretty sure the majority of the kids were kind of tuned out and focusing on other things. Oh my God, that's so annoying. I see it all the time. I'm like, why are the teachers not reading? They're playing this boring voice and it's like, I can't even pay attention. <laughs> I could totally relate to that. And it's like, these voices sound robotic and boring. It's like you could pass out. I could totally relate to that, Christopher. And you know, Christopher, another thing I could relate to is um, now a lot of schools are moving to structured literacy and I think the article spoke about how a lot of like schools are just preparing kids to take a test and they're not letting kids read an actual whole book. It's just like reading little pieces and stuff like that. And that's probably not that enjoyable. Yeah, like especially, um, I guess, the weeks prior to state testing in ELA, we were just reading, uh, we we're just practicing reading um, like short little prompts and being able to answer questions on them or in either multiple choice or paragraph or essay format. So, I mean, it's not, we're not really getting anything, getting anything out of it. We're kind of just learning how to perform decent enough on the test. So the school looks like teaching. Sorry, Christopher, you other guys are going to get a cheers in a couple of seconds, but Faith, come on, Christopher needs to cheers because he's telling the actual truth. That's exactly <laughs> what's happening in a lot of those classrooms. <laughs> Faith, you're muted. Faith, you're muted. See, I forget all the time. It's just about the test. Ultimately, that's what it is. It's just about the test. So cheers. <laughs> so, Kira, give us a little bit of what you're thinking here, some advice, any thoughts from what your mom said or what you heard. I feel like the schools could do a better job and also that goes up to like the state and the government of how we like teach the kids and it's not really it doesn't seem like a priority and I feel like it should be because these were the next generation and like even in 
my home school, we, um, the librarian is the curriculum coordinator now, who has never even taught a class in her life. And she's so what you're, so Kira, what you're saying is that you feel that um, the person who's in charge now might be a lovely person and, and she knows books and, and knows her job, but maybe not the right person to set the tone for what should be taught. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So, you know, I, I know that your mom worked with you. How did that feel having your mom teach you? Was that a, a tough go for you? Or did you just, were you just so thankful that somebody was showing you how to read? I was very like thankful that my mom like stepped in, but it kind of felt better because in a sense, I feel like when teachers are teaching you, they get like, I don't know how you put it, but like very, like my mom didn't care if I got something wrong. The teachers like care, if that kind of makes sense. Like they just make it, like they discipline you. Like if you do they, something. They made it wrong instead of celebrating, hey, look, you got this wrong. Now we know what to work on. Instead, it's the other way around. Wrong, try it again. Wrong, try it. Instead of saying, great, now I know what you get, you need to work on. So as a mom, I would just look at that and go, all right, yeah, we got this. You know, all right, I know what I know what we need to do. And especially so, with I'm sorry, Kira, what'd you say, especially with um like teachers, I feel like they can be how do I put this? Some teachers. <laughs> Some teachers can really embarrass you and make you feel less than. Yeah. And mm -hmm. like, especially with reading, uh, I've gotten embarrassed multiple times in school and it's just not right. And I feel like that should be something that is dealt with, like. And just not put it aside, like, oh, the teacher didn't mean it. Like, yeah. Laura, can I ask? Can I ask you to give like a specific of like what kind of things do you feel can embarrass kids, so that our teachers listening here today might gain some words of wisdom of things that they should not do? Um, popcorn reading, writing stuff on the board, as like sight word practice. How about? How about? Um, when you're called on. When oh, yeah, being be, called on. Um, when should you be called on? Only if you raise your hand. I don't think it's right to call on any student that, even if they weren't paying attention, there could be something else going on in their house or, like, anything. You shouldn't just call on somebody just because you see them not paying attention. That's really mean, in my opinion. And it could be embarrassing. And so what you're saying, to try to do all you can to avoid an embarrassing situation. Yeah. Okay. Max, hi. Is he there? Yeah. Hi. So, Max, um, is there anything that maybe you can share that was important to you and that perhaps you might want to let others know about yeah. whether it's just about your feelings or about the whole process? Um, was it tough? Was it, was well, it? I had, I had more been lied to. So trying to like give advice to that, it's going to be kind of hard because you don't believe it at the same time. So did you feel that, um, that you were being lied to? Your mother was being um, lied to? So it was around, I think, was it second? Yeah, second or third grade. Um, the the past in reality. Um, that's like around the time, and then it became a spiral. Who I trust and who I didn't trust at that point. So yeah, you, the second to third grade year was when we understood that the counsel we were getting from the school was not truthful. Um, and it, it wasn't what he needed. Um, and that was a pivot point for, I think him personally, 
where um, at one point as a second grader, I was just retelling this to him the other day that it was rather insightful at one point out of just sheer frustration one night at home. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he's beating himself up and would call him stupid. And oh. he referred to one of his teachers as like he saw himself as the problem. Um, and he said, you know, I know she yeah. wants to teach me, but but we'll she can't or I can't. Um, but once he got appropriate structured literacy reading interventions, uh, that changed and he knew he wasn't stupid. Um, he just didn't know he had dyslexia and families shouldn't have to find that out on their own privately. So Max, did, did that kind of destroy your trust in adults, this whole experience? Did you find yourself feeling like you know, people didn't really believe in you and that maybe, you know, you it, it kind of destroyed your trust maybe in teachers or adults in general? Um, it was more like special teachers. Well, some, I didn't really care about teachers because well, unless it was coming to um, like IEPs, then I might. Um Except for that, that's the only thing I can think of would make me not like them. So as far as kids go, Max, kids like yourself, um, is there anything that you would tell kids out there who are struggling to read or write? Because now apparently you're doing quite well. So what would you tell them? If, you know, if you could talk to a younger child now who might be in second grade, third grade, fourth grade, what, what, what advice would you give them, Max? Um, you might want to check what you're doing if you have special classes, but that's like the only thing I can think of Maybe for the be, program. Be in communication with a trusted adult at home. Yeah. About what you're going through. Yeah. Yeah. Go through steps. I think that that's an important one. Even as a mother by myself, like, you know, when my children were growing up, I feel like sometimes kids aren't as open with their parents as they should be sometimes. And I think having that honest conversation and being open with your parents is so important. Like even with my own kid, um, you know, it was a fine balance. I knew there was stuff going on in school and my my child was a great reader, but he had his own issues. And I was like, should I read his cell phone? Should I not read his cell phone? And, you know, you worry about your kids. And I think like one of the most important things that I see that all three of you did is you communicated with your parents. So could I ask the three of you, honestly, um, when you're going through these reading issues, did it affect your self-esteem? And if it did affect your self-esteem, did you do you feel you recovered, and what has that been like? Was your self esteem affected at some point, Christopher? I think you're muted. Do you want to say something? I mean, with um, when it comes to reading, I was never really um, not I was never really that bad when it came to reading, so that was fine with me. But when it came to That's writing. Good. When it came to writing and having kind of like um, not very good sentences of mine or stuff like that, like displayed all over the classroom and seeing kids like read it and poke fun. Yeah, that, that kind of um, plays a big role in my self-esteem. But I think now that I'm like learned how to write properly and now that I'm, I consider myself to be a pretty good writer now, I guess I'm kind of like recovered from Can I ask you something else, Christopher? Can I ask you something else? So like I actually work with a lot of kids as well and a lot of them can read really well and some of them can't write really well. And I, and I'm finding like a lot of teachers are giving those kids like voice to text and dictation and all kind of tools and not focusing on the writing. Did you get those kind of tools and did you find those tools were helpful or did you wish that your teachers would focus more on actually teaching you those writing skills um right away I'm just curious I mean I was um in elementary school I was given a Chromebook to 
like be able to do um voice to text but i never really um used the voice to text i mostly just typed it out i i kind of knew that it was more important to focus on actually being able to write than just kind of you know using crutches i guess good answer chris <laughs> <laughs> um, um, that makes me very proud to hear that you're succeeding and that you feel confident. Um, Kira, what about you? What about your self-esteem? So then and now. So I feel like when I was younger, I was bullied a lot and a lot of kids made fun of me. So it definitely did affect it because just kids can be mean and like, I don't think it's their fault. It's not their fault. It's the people who raise them. And then, and then I feel like now I'm, my self esteem is pretty good. And yeah. Are you going to do some bragging? Maybe. Well, I'd like to hear because I know that Sherry, you were saving this for the show. How is Kira doing now a year later? Because I had you and Kira on a year ago on my Facebook business page to talk about when you were just kind of um, at that point where things were turning with the word wasp and the hornet. But now it's a year later. So what's happening now? So so I just want to make, make it clear that dyslexia is not cured. So I just I just want parents to understand that this it's still there. So she's still, you know, she still has her, her problems, but uh, you know, like we all do in this house. But um there's a lot of bragging that should be going on. So Kira took her regents this what? What do you want to talk about? Okay, you can say oh uh, what? You wanna go? Yeah. Okay, then go. <laughs> <laughs> um well I took my regences and I got um well, in New York State, they do regences, which are a test on most of the teachers, and I don't really believe in them in a sense, but I do study for them. And um, in art science, I got the highest grade out of the entire school. What was your grade? I got 97. Wow! Put in the cheers button now. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. So I I want to also say I, I actually Sherry and uh I took that Earth Science region and let me tell you that region there's a lot of reading you have to do on that test. <laughs> I so want not to only do you have to have a lot of science knowledge, you have to know how to read well. And if you can't read well, you're not gonna do great on that test. So kudos, Kira. Thank you. She's she studied, she so now <laughs> she can read all by herself. So like Christopher said. Um, you know, she had the accommodations and this, this, and this. And then she was just like, I just want to do it by myself. And, you know, she did it by herself. But that's not the only thing. There's so much more in school. What what happened with global global history? Uh, so my global history exam, I got a 92. And then... Mastery, right? Yeah, mastery. And then geometry, I got 84, which geometry is pretty hard test to pass. Most people don't pass it. Yep. And then That's incredible, yeah. wonderful. Yeah. So then, wonderful. and and now, um, so she's also now she's taking out books at the library, whereas before she would never read because she couldn't read. So now she's taking books out that I that I look at. I'm like, do you really want that? Yeah, mom, <laughs> I want that book. I'm like, okay, all right. And um, and she also volunteers. She goes with my husband, um, uh, and volunteers at a um, at a temple. And they they have um, go ahead. It, it's um it's like a it, it's like um like a Sunday school. Yeah, right? it's like a Hebrew school. And um I have sixth graders and one of my students in my class is um has She has some needs. Yeah. And so I'm her scribe and her like reader so now I write for her and read for her <laughs> that's fabulous <laughs> that's awesome so who would ever think right that's well that's the encouraging thing we want to leave parents with that's an, a wonderful story too Stacy and Thank Matt you. 
where are we now? So we know where Max was, and now what is Max doing? What's happening? Well, Max just started high school. Yeah. A freshman in high school. He's Perfect. taking an honors earth science class and geometry as a freshman. And he's reading at grade level. Um, and we're just really proud of the fact that he's um, remained such a hard worker throughout this entire process. And um, he's respectful, goes to school. He's ready to learn um, despite what he's been through. And uh, we're really grateful that that's that amazing. Like that been so steadfast and, and persevered. That's amazing. That's that's really wonderful. Good for you. Good for you. And Christopher, just circling back, I heard you're on the swim team. In you made the swim team in yeah, Shamanad. Is that right? Now Shamanad is a top Catholic school, isn't it? Yeah. And they're all by yourself, apparently. Yeah. No tests yeah. or anything. Yeah, a lot of the kids um took like like I guess like classes months ahead i just had like and tutors for yeah the, months for and, the tax exam and he didn't have any of that yeah i just had like some book off amazon but um, he's he's very modest like he got i think 98 on his algebra regents in eighth grade last year and he got i think it was 97 or 98 like close like whatever score you got on the earth science regents he got last year in eighth grade and and now what grades are you getting that's um, um i don't know it's the beginning of the year so like not yeah. a lot of stuff is in but I, i'm like hundreds of ninety eights and like most of my things. But it's like that's amazing. I mean, that's anything. that's yeah. amazing. Can I ask them something, Faith? Let me ask the kids one more thing, the teenagers one more thing. If 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 schools could be made better, what would be the biggest tips you would give to principals or administrators listening today? Your t- if you had to pick three things off the top of your head that can make schools better for kids, what would it be? Who's going and, first? If and if there's only one or two that you could think of, don't stress to get to three. You never know. They might be able to do three. No, but I'm just saying, you know what? If they can't, they can't. What could, what could make school much better? Tell those principals out there that are listening today, because we got a um, lot of administrators listening. I think, um, I guess the biggest thing, at least in my eyes, is kind of like you got to get the students like involved and you got to get them motivated like they want it they have to want to like learn and everything it can't just be oh give them the materials and let them do whatever with it they have to be motivated in order to really succeed in whatever you want them to do but do you think that when they give you materials and you have to teach yourself it's motivating or is it when they teach you it's motivating um yeah i mean teach yourself really doesn't work it kind of like so that that's very interesting because a lot of times people will say, "Oh, hand it over to the kids and let them figure it out and give them choice." Exactly. Kids want the direction. That's what I'm hearing from you. They want the guidance. They want the directions. They want to be taught, and that's motivating. Is that Chris? What you're saying? Yeah. Obviously, there's some like. I guess you could argue that there's like a rewarding factor when you like figure out a problem on your own. Well, what happens if you're never able to figure that out on your own? What happens on a test where you see something that you were never taught? You're just, you're not going to be able to figure that out on your own on a time test where you're kind of stressing out. And Chris, what do you think about group work too? Cause I know you complained about that a lot. Yeah. Group work. I'm, I'm not a big fan of it, I guess. I mean, it could be fun if you're with your friends, but, if you're in a group where you guys don't really know each other and nobody's really cooperating, like um, one of the one of the first days of school, we did like a group work problem in math, and I had to, I spent like the whole time, pretty much trying to convince my group mates that um, how to solve the problem. Yeah, how to solve the problem. They just weren't having it. And then when we did it on the whiteboard, or when the teacher explained it, then. I was right, and we just wasted the whole period essentially. So, what you're talking Kira, about, any, oh, yeah, so that's committee work, also. I think when you say group work, I think you know, that's, funny, left that in a group. that's funny that Christopher mentions that because I 
you know, it's funny. A lot of the classrooms, they have like kids sitting in these groups. And then how are you supposed to pay attention to what the teacher's teaching? And also when you're looking at other kids, it's very motivating to talk about anything other than <laughs> what the teacher's teaching possibly, right? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Especially for a structured literacy lesson, when your teacher's supposed to be trying to teach you how to read and you're looking at the your friend's face rather than at the board. I don't know. I don't know. I just Anybody else want to tell us own, stuff? My own children never really loved that either, Chris, because they often said that they would do all the work and then they were part of this committee and they would just get frustrated and it was kind of an uneven that yeah so that's a little tough yeah that's kind of what i would have to do considering that like the whole group gets a grade like we all get the same grade so i don't want to just have like a five on a classwork assignment because nobody else wanted to put in their share so i would just end up pretty much um doing most of the work when it came to group stuff mm -hmm. so kira you any advice? Any advice to those principals and administrators out there? How can they make school better for kids? I feel like if you, I feel like you should, this is kind of hard because there's so many kids in a school, but if you really try to focus on the individual and focus on how they learn, even if like the teacher, like teacher only has 20, 25 kids, you can kind of get the idea of how each kid learns. And I feel like that'd be more like beneficial to the kids and to the teachers. I feel like the teachers wouldn't be teaching something that kids are just staring at them like have no idea what they're saying. I feel like also that kids are trying their best and they're not trying to like kids are there's kids aren't trying to fail. Kids aren't trying to fail and like if kids are like being funny and not doing stuff in class, there's probably something else going on. It's not just they're trying to be disruptive and so what you're saying is sometimes that silly poor behavior is a sign of something that's deeper that has not come to the surface is yeah. that what you're trying to say yeah I would agree with that so your advice would be to get to know each child as an individual yeah that's very good advice <laughs> Um, anything else we can add? Any advice from the clients? Anybody have any advice for principals? Um, I would go way higher and go for uh, like the dish, um, go for higher status because principals can do nothing. Because um, if you have a principal, the person who's above them will kick them out and get a new principal. Doesn't do anything in that case. They'll kick them out of the office and then get a new principal who can actually follow their work. So are you talking about superintendents, Max? Like sure. you to reach the people who are in charge of the district because the principals have a boss too. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. I think cool. Max is reiterating some of what Kira shared on a previous podcast um, that I think that they did with you, Faith, and that is... Um, administration, I think, is um, very troubling in this scenario in terms of how we find a viable path forward. Um, you know, Sherry, you shared that there was a teacher who was pivotal um, at a critical moment for you. And I know that those teachers are out there and I appreciate those teachers. I acknowledge that there can be consequences for them. Um, I also know that there are unions and professional organizations um, that also protect them and shelter them. And a lot of teachers will choose not to step forward because they fear repercussions. And so in our situation, you know, sometimes the principal might have the leverage that a student or a family or a community needs, but um, a lot of times it's, it's higher than that. Well, it's, you know, know, I'm sorry. Yes, go ahead, Max. I think that's not the case. I don't think it's the, um, so, can't say name. but, uh, it was, was it, yeah, it was fifth grade. Uh, I've had a teacher, was it first and second? It might've been kindergarten. I'm not sure. But when it come, 
him. And when it came to the uh, law, one teacher with the other one just said silent. Well, the other one did didn't care about the job. She and then after the thing was over, she moved to different district. But what shows they might care about the job more than the the correct thing to do. So what you're saying is that from your perspective, you felt that some of the teachers were not there for the right reasons. Is that what you're saying? I heard you say that some of them cared more about keeping their job well, than they did doing the right thing in the classroom for the students. There could have been BM to yeah. blackmail, I doubt it, but oh, yeah. couldn't put it past. Like, uh, I do have, I know one, like, I live close to one. That's not the case. It was a bit different there because mm -hmm. I know them closely. I drive by their house yeah. a lot, so. He's trying not to name names, which I appreciate. Um, but it's, I, I think the gist of it is it's more complicated than it needs to be. And um, it's, it's difficult to realize that teachers find themselves in such a position where they feel like their jobs are in jeopardy if they do the right thing for the students. Um, and, and that's a reality that we have to acknowledge um, and it's troubling. Yeah, and I, and I, Stacey, I could totally agree with that. And I think that, you know, working in the field, this is my 28th year, I think that many teachers in the profession, their heart is in the right place, but a lot of teachers only have so much control. Like they don't even have control of like what they're doing in the classroom sometimes. And maybe they want to use certain type of books and they don't have that full control. And I think even, you know, as we're shifting towards more structured literacy, there's just you know, sometimes the teacher's hands feel tired. Sometimes they want to spend more time, you know, teaching kids how to read, but there's so many things that, you know, administrators, like your son was saying, are saying, you got to do this and you got to do this and you got to do this. And, 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 and teachers, you know, they're just trying to get through the day and follow the rules and yes, keep their jobs. But I think that the truth is that many teachers really, really want to help kids and, and um, there's just some barriers that sometimes, unfortunately, get in the way. We don't have full control. And um, I just hope that, you know, the teachers listening today, just, just do what's best for kids. Close that door. Make sure you teach them how to read. Don't give up. And be true to yourself, you know. Tell your principal what you're feeling. And I think the biggest leverage point that teachers have is data. Hold on to your data because data doesn't lie. That's where it's no longer your opinion. Collect your data. Present your data. Know your data. And that's the strongest tool that you have to say, hey, this is where we're at. We need to formulate next steps to help that child. And the other tip that I can give teachers in the field is we don't just collect uh, data three times a year during benchmark collection periods. We progress monitor and we make sure that there's a shift in data. And when things aren't shifting, that's the time for parents to say, how's that data shifting? If it's not shifting, what are we gonna do? That's the time for teachers to also say, hey, I have this student. These are the things that are working. These are the things that are not working. Don't be afraid to tell your administrator, hey, this is what, what's going on. This is what's happening with my students. If your principal is not giving you enough time to spend on teaching kids how to read, be honest, speak your truth. Don't be afraid. You have to as much as you can. I know teachers, you don't have full control, but don't be afraid to uh, fight for those kids. And um, I really want to thank everybody for being here. This has been, a Faith, has this been the episode that we've had the most people on in um, general? Well, we had the one with the five fathers. So um, how many people do we have here today? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's pretty amazing. We yeah. have a dog too. Oh, oh. Dude, can look at that. <laughs> well, here's what I'd like to say. I want to leave people with some thoughts um, in terms of what we have here. I think that 
if we have teachers listening, please don't feel defensive or angry. These are honest opinions from the students themselves, from their parents who had to go through a system. And we have to let go of taking things personally and realize that if this, you know, if you had a child who was struggling, this is what you would want for them. We have to put ourselves in the shoes of the people who are in these situations. And I just want to say, parents, if you're out there listening, you see that there are different ways of approaching this. It's not so simple sometimes just to say, you know, my child's not doing well. Sometimes that's all you have to do, but often it's not. And often it could take months and years. And look where we are now that we have teenagers speaking their truth, right? And we have to listen to them. So there are options. Hopefully it doesn't come to that point like Stacey Klein, who's, you know, um, in the position where this was going on for years. And um, she's on here because she's trying to turn things around for other parents. So Stacey, I want to thank you for speaking up and speaking out because really um, I know you've gone through hell and back and uh, it has not been easy for you or Max. I want to ask Stacy one more thing. Stacy, can I ask you a very honest question? It's going to be kind of a crazy question, but it's something that's on my mind. Sure. So I know when you get attorneys involved, there's usually a cost. What would what recommendation would you give to parents that don't have the financial means to uh, get an advocate or get an attorney? Because a lot of the students that I work with, they don't have any financial resources. A lot of those kids live in shelters. So what advice can you give parents that might not have the financial resources to um, seek an attorney or an advocate? What do, what can they do? Oh, and that's such a heartbreaking uh, scenario because as difficult and long as ex and expensive emotionally and financially um, as our uh, legal saga has been, um, it would be worse if I was a mom who couldn't do what needed to be done for my student. And that's what, that's the question you're asking. I think that there are power in numbers. Um, if there's a way for, you know, parents um, who don't have the financial means to get an advocate or an attorney, if they can find each other um, and network and approach an organization, uh, whether it's a disability law center, uh, which does do pro bono work, or I think most states have ARC, A-R-C, um, PACER, I believe, is in many states. They offer low cost or free advocacy services. In my experience, they only take things so far. Um, but I think that, you know, one, one person can be a small problem. Um, five people can get somebody's attention, right? And perhaps you could get the attention of someone um, like myself. I mean, I've gone on to get formal advocacy training, and I do a lot of pro bono work for parents um, who find me. And uh, granted, I can only take them so far, uh, but it might be enough to get them to the next person to hand off to do more um, or or find a, a champion in some way. I, I wish I had a better answer. I, it's it's um, humbling to realize that I, I don't have a magic card to play for that scenario. I also think that a lot of times parents are um, ashamed and they hide what's going on in their home or with their kids. And that's why you three courageous moms really set an example for other moms to be able to come forward and ask for help and to speak out. It's not easy. It's not easy what our teens did tonight. It's not easy what the moms are doing, but they're doing it for the greater good. So I want to thank all of you. 
Um, as far as uh, what we mentioned, so we mentioned the word wasp is what Sherry used, the hornet and the word wasp. We could put that in the show notes. And um, so if anybody who wants to give it a try and try tutoring their own or get other people who might help, Sherry also um, is a consultant for homeschool moms. She has seven kids of her own and will put her contact information in if anybody wants to get in touch with Sherry. Denora, I know you are busy as could be with your career, but you still always find time to help others. Um, Denora, I don't know how many times I've given your phone number out. <laughs> you were kind enough to always take phone calls of moms I've recommended to speak to you. I'm so, happy to help whoever I can, however I can help them. You yeah. Need that from the bottom of my heart. I don't want to see anybody go through, um, have to go through nine IEP meetings in six months or a year. I haven't needed we sit through faith and they were like hours. Some of them didn't even Ma end Marathon. I, I never had, there were four hour meetings, remember? Five hours and then they'd just be tabled and then we just have to come back and just, yeah. It was, it was like a circus. It really and, was. Uh, honestly, having done this type of stuff, Denora knows that's oh not God. my favorite thing. No. I do not like going in and doing those things. I don't like confrontation like that. But I do like this and I want to wrap up and I want to thank everybody for joining us. Fabulous night. Thank you so much. And this kicks off our Adolescent Literacy Month. We're going to have two big episodes coming up in October, and that will be with our adolescent literacy specialists from the UK. Um, and we just have a lot of interesting things coming up. So keep recommending it. If you think this episode would be helpful to a friend or a colleague, please pass it along so that if you know anyone who has a child who's struggling, let them see that there are teenagers brave enough like these three who are speaking out and speaking up. Thank you. All right, so we're gonna wrap up in a second. So follow us on the literacyview.com, that's our website. Also, hopefully Faith will finally come up with a literacy view bullshit button so all these parents could come to their IEP meetings and PPT meetings with the literacy view bullshit button. I want to buy the first one. <laughs> oh my God, we have to do it. We've been saying that. Also, one. join our Facebook group, the Literacy View, Real Teachers Letting Loose, and make sure you share our episodes. Tell everybody about us. You could also advertise with the Literacy View now. And if you feel like it, donate to what we're doing. We're not making any money, but we're hopefully changing lives one view at a time. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you.